Do I have to do the recording, Wendy? It's recording okay. automatically. Okay, good. All right, so we can just wait a minute or so for a few more people to log in and then we'll just get going. Is smart tab. You you must get your video off. Are they there? Probably not. <laughs> um, trying to exit full screen mode when I've got my screen and I can get our people up. We have twenty seven people with us, which is great. Welcome everybody. Um, just want to get our little plan. All right, you're on speaker view. Um, should we, it doesn't seem like we've got any more people joining for now and everybody can pop in as they need to. So welcome everybody. Um, this is the third eclectic webinar that Shirley and I have done together. Um, you don't necessarily need to do them in a sort of chronological order. But the first one we did was a long session on a Saturday morning about a month ago, and we covered what exactly was eclectic home education. Um, we last Thursday evening, we covered the preschool years and we looked at little footprints. And in that um, uh, webinar, we or, or live stream, we discussed the Moore formula. If any of you have preschoolers and missed last week, please let me know. And we can send you the link to that. Uh, tonight, we're going to focus on um, mainly on some of the fabulous tried and tested curricula that Shirley and I used over our 20 plus years of homeschooling. That we're still using. <laughs> oh, yes, still using. That, um, I keep talking about homeschooling in the past tense because you do, because your kids are finished, <laughs> but I'm actually still homeschooling three kids. Yeah, still <laughs> anyway. Yeah, that, that, and, and just stuff that worked for us in, in that sort of. Um, tailor-made, customized um, um, education experience. So um, that's where we're jumping in. And um, Shirley, should we quickly run through how we see um, the, the sort of two baskets or two groups of education? Yes. Okay. So um, just quickly, we like to divide um, curriculum into two groups. The first group is your discipline studies. That's your English reading, writing, and mathematics, because it doesn't matter what you're going to do in life. Those are the skills that you're going to need at one or other level. And then in the other one is the fun stuff. That is your history, geography, science, art, coding, um, learning to type, music, anything goes into the other basket. And that is your discretionary subject. So tonight we're going to split into those two things. And while we're looking at discretionary subjects, we're going to do um, an overview of our, our precious baby, our flagship curriculum, Footprints on Our Land. So going from there, Shills, you want to um, jump in? Okay, well, let's start with um, talking about some of the maths programs, because that's probably the first subject that parents think, oh, I've got to get that right. We don't want to screw up our children's ability in maths. And you know, whatever curriculum you choose initially, they all work. And what you have to do is try a couple if you're not happy with the first one that you use until you find something that that does work for you. And so Wendy and I have used different programs because we started out with different things and our kids are different and we're different. And so what, what worked for me after trying two other maths programs, I switched to Matthew C. And it, it has worked with all my children. So... And, and a lot of other homeschoolers like it too. So I think, you know, it, it suits a broad range of kids. And what I love about it is that the maths expert, Steve Demi, teaches your kids the new maths concept. So every week or every new lesson, they first watch a video clip where he teaches whatever it is that they're learning. And then they'll 
are six lessons in the workbook that the child has to do. The first three are mastering the new skills and the last three are a combination of those new skills and work they've learned before so that they keep up with whatever it is that they, they've done in the past. And then there's a test. And I like that because the test helps me as the parent to gauge, have they mastered this lesson? Are they ready to move on? Or did they get 12 out of 20 and there's a problem and we need to review and see were they just slapdash and in a hurry today? Or was there something they didn't understand? Um, <laughs> okay, Wendy's just gone. I was going to switch back to her. In her home, I'll just start so long. So she I had to get rid of a dog because otherwise okay. she's going to click all the way. Don't forget our lovely screen show that I labored over <laughs> your, your introduction um, things because um, there's also some nice pictures on there that parents can get a feel for what um, Matthew C. and Saxon looks like. But sorry. Um, yeah. No, no, I don't have those photos, Wayne. Sorry. Didn't I I've, only got the foot, I've only got the footprints once. So if you want, to, just uh, you do the screen share if you can get it while we talk. Okay. 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 Well, you carry on chatting. Yeah. All right. So you found those pics. So Wendy chose Saxon Maths, which is also a very popular um, American maths program. And the reason she liked it was that she felt that she's not a strong maths candidate. She battled with it all her life. And this program gave her confidence. So, you know, she hasn't tried math, you see, I think it would give you confidence too, but um, all of us have different, <laughs> have different needs. I mean, I haven't tried Saxon either. So there you go. But it worked for Wendy. And um, I think all your children used Saxon, didn't they? Or did you switch at some point? Um, we actually did a couple of years with Matthew C. Um, so let me see if I can get the screen share right. I normally leave this technical um, point to, to Shirley, but uh, <laughs> let's take a look and see. Um, host is disabled attendee screen sharing. So that's not going to work. Maybe I can quickly just email them to you, Shirley. Um, but okay, yeah, so, um, so with Saxon Math, um, the, the major difference, sorry, I'm going to be a little distracted. Just give me a minute um, and then I can send this to you. Um, we obviously did not have good communication before we sent this. Um, so I actually started off with something called um, a Mikwan Maths. And I did two years of that with um, one of my children and found that it wasn't, it didn't give me the safety net that I needed. Um, I gave up mass instead at seven um, in school. So I think that, what is that now, grade nine, Shirley? Yes. Okay. Grade nine. Yeah. And, um, and what that meant is that I had quite a few um, very negative feelings about maths. And also I switched off in school. So I had a lot of um, gaps in my mathematical foundation. So I didn't want to then um, pass that feeling on to my children. And um, with research found that Saxon math gave me a, to the point that it told me where a blank was for your child's name to speak mathematically, to think mathematically. So I was actually able to get my children to a, um, an algebra one level. Um, and after then I, I looked up the closest tutor and, and thank goodness we found her and she saw my kids through for their <laughs> 10, 11 and 12. <laughs> Cause that was when I checked out. Um, just see if that email has come through while I carry on chatting. But um, so the, we, with one of my children, she did um, three years of uh, Matthew C and it really did work well for her. But for all the other kids, um, we use Saxon math all the way. And I think the, the most important thing to look at is that both of them follow um, a very concrete, um, very concrete way of approaching mathematics before they move the child onto an abstract form of maths. So um, with things like Mikwan and six, the Saxon maths and that they moved very quickly through the different topics and from abstract to concrete. Whereas with Saxon, every single time you're introducing a new topic, 
um, you first do it in the concrete and then you move on to the um, to the to the abstract and um, the major difference between the two is that um, Saxon is a um, incremental system in other words you cover everything every time you do one of their grades you will cover geometry and fractions and addition and subtraction etc whereas Matthew C tends to focus more on one of the mathematical disciplines but as Shirley said right at the beginning um, maths is maths and it will teach your children to count and to subtract and to add and it just needs to be something that you are confident with. Um, on the slideshow, which I think Shirley is still looking for, uh, we mentioned a few others that have become very popular with homeschoolers. We haven't worked with them themselves, but I'm putting them out there because they repeatedly come up in conversations and recommendations. Um, and they are also done by homeschoolers for homeschoolers. So you will notice that that is one of the things that Shirley and I often share is that the programs that we recommend generally are always written by homeschoolers. In this case, I'm a homeschool dad, high school maths teacher. Later on, we're going to look at some language programs. Those are also written by either homeschool grads themselves or homeschooling parents. Because what it does is that it doesn't assume that behind you is a body of knowledge, that you have got um, seven to ten years of teacher training experience etc and um, it says pick up this book open this book and you're ready to go with your kids and I think that's that's that that was a safety net that I found with Saxon um, did our screen show come through there or are you still waiting I've, for it? I've got them yeah okay. I just need to hear me on what we're talking about next because, okay. Um, okay well that was number one so if you want to quickly flash folks through that one with the um, with the uh, pictures of Matthew C and Saxon Maths. I think I've labeled them there for you. Uh, yeah. Hang on, sorry. No, I've only got the, all the heading, all the separator slides that you made. Yes, yes, that was what I was talking about. So that okay, the separator right. slides. So one? Number one, we've just done maths. So that was number one. I did put them in order. I try to be very organized for you today. I know, but as I've downloaded them, I've lost the numbering, Wendy. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> <It's not very laughs> well. Oh, sure, no problem. Um, okay, well, maybe you can just figure out how to allow me to, um, unless I must reclaim host and quickly share the... Maybe uh, do that. I think okay. reclaim host. Then okay, I'll, I'm now the host. So let's see if, if my technological skills actually allow me to share a screen with you guys. Um, and you can all give me an applause if I do manage it. So um, <laughs> let's see if that happens. Share screen, and I want to share that one. Okay, it's sharing. There we go. go. See, now I have to show off my lovely screens because I worked so hard on them. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so so um, on the top right, you've got what you would get, um, that manipulative kit from Saxon, and that's this um, grade one books. And it's pretty much the same until you get to the high school programs. And then it goes on to a workbook, a parent guide, and a test manual. Um, Shirley, you want to quickly explain the Matthew C manipulatives down there? So Matthew C comes with a DVD. And then there's a box of the maths blocks. And they are used in every lesson to demonstrate the different subjects. So... Steve Demi has a, a magnetic set that he puts on a whiteboard and your children have their own set. And then, can you hear that? A heater just clicked on. Sorry. <laughs> so, <just> <laughs> yeah. so um, there are different size blocks in different colors. And that's why it's called Matthew C, because the children actually get to see what they're doing. And I was blown away about what 20 years ago when I watched it was still an old VHS cassette it was a sample video that was sent to me and he explained the concept of that unknown factor x that's used in algebra and explained it using manipulative blocks and I had done high school maths all the way to matric level and done quite well and I looked at this video and I thought I have never understood maths like this and 
I still can't explain that to anybody else, but I understood <laughs> it. And <laughs> I just thought it was brilliant. So that's what convinced me to try it. For I thought, well, I'm just going to give it a go. And once we switched to Matt, you see, I was very happy with it for all my kids, as I've said. So I carried on. So what subject are we talking about next? Um, should I try again? <laughs> so we're still in the discipline category um, of... Um, of uh, the schooling and what the next thing is we're looking at is um, because we're in primary school we are doing a learn to read um, which is the um, while we're going to cover reading in a um, in a different format now uh, the the learn to read section is up next so you've got over here um, two of the things we did the bottom uh, <laughs> I'll share this with um, a bit of fear and trepidation. The bottom book, Teach Your Child to Read in 100 Easy Lessons, is quite frowned upon these days. But um, for three of my children, um, it worked like an absolute charm. The, uh, my other son had um, dyslexia and we needed to use a different program. But it is simply exactly what it says. By lesson 80 in the book, um, kids are pretty much reading fluently and in a wide variety of lessons, but it is rejected by a lot of people because it doesn't have bells and whistles. It's um, a big fat book. The text looks a bit weird because they, they teach blending in a very specific way, but it does the job. So just to be completely honest, that is what I used um, to get my children to read. Besides for in the really early years, we would um, do stuff quite organically in terms of recognizing their name and Shirley's ABC fun should probably be in there as a pre-reading um, pre skill that you can um, uh, make your children familiar with the shapes of letters and do all sorts of fun activities. Um, we did also touch on Explore the Code. Shirley can cover that as well, because I know that um, you use that most of the way for your kids. Um, but those were two things, and then I've given you some other options there at the bottom. Yeah, so we also just played, you know, later games in the preschool years and looked at the, you know, whatever was on the labels of groceries and stop signs and things out and about just to recognize letters. And then for my kids' sort of grade one year, the first five I used explode the code and they're just little workbooks and they're very repetitive and you know it teaches them the rat set on the mat type of thing and they have to write it and yeah it's it's a good phonics program and then by the end of book one two and three they could actually read pretty well and then we switched over to different things depending on which other curriculum products we were using for other subjects. When my sixth child had to learn to read, I was so bored of having done Explode the Code five times over <laughs> that I decided to try something else and I had discovered the free printable workbooks that you can download from a website called progressivephonics.com and he was actually one of these children like a lot of the youngest kids in homeschooling families, he already actually knew his phonics by the time he was of an age where it was time for formal lessons. He could already read three letter words. So it was actually quite easy to just take him through the basics using that program. And I can't even remember how many of them we worked through because there's quite a number of different books, probably about two or three of them that I can remember printing and I just bound them at a, at a photocopy shop. And so I use progressive phonics. And what I liked about that, there wasn't a lot of um, writing necessary to learn to read. But what, was, what made it more fun for me was that instead of reading these repetitive silly sentences with the limited vocabulary that a beginner reader has, uh, there's a name for what it is, which I've forgotten now, for this particular style of teaching. So you will read a poem or a little sentence but they're black words that the mom reads and then the red words are the words that the child is learning. And so you can sit together, he was often on my lap or next to me and we could read little poems and little texts that were slightly more interesting than, you know, stop, spot, spot, 
jump spot jump or whatever is in most typical children's readers that's what i remember from my readers at school this repetition mm -hmm. that was so boring and monotonous so it made it a little bit more fun and like i said the same with the maths i used to want worry in the beginning when i taught my first child to read um you know have i used the best program because the problem with learning to read english is that there's so many exceptions to the rules that after you've learned those basic 44 phonetic sounds and the blends, then you just encounter all these weird things like the O-U-G-H that can be cough or like through or mm -hmm. enough or whatever. And it used to worry me, you know, I'd heard about all the other programs with bells and whistles as Wendy says. And then what really put my mind at ease was Ruth Beechick's three little books. Um, well, I think it's now published as one book, it's called The Three R's. And in it, she said that English has so many loose ends and so many exceptions that your children are just going to learn those as they encounter them. And that made me feel, Phew, we didn't miss something. You know, I didn't not cover everything because you can't cover everything. Mm -hmm. So if anybody else has that feeling, I hope that will just reassure you. So you teach them the basics and the rest they learn on the fly. On the fly, yeah. And and um, once children are reading, the point is just to keep on putting good books into their hands. There's some amazing book lists out there. And even if you don't buy Sunlight, All the Good and the Beautiful, or My Father's World, or any of them, just find those book lists. Thousand Good Book List is another one. And just let them read. And then let them read in their interests. And then you fill in the gaps on other reading. Um, I often tell folks that I do a consultation with that um, my one child would not read any form of fiction. The only thing that he wanted to read when he could read was Popular Mechanics magazine. And that was good enough for me. Um, so as long as once they're reading, you just keep on putting good literature into their hands and just let them go. Um, we don't need to, to overthink that. So no, just... Just yeah. another comment there. I had a mom email me saying, my children don't want to read. And she felt like a complete failure. And so while we say, let them read, there are some kids, I've got two out of my six who are bookworms who love reading and it's the oldest and it's the youngest. And I'm sure I did the same thing with the middle ones too, but they are different and they're not such eager, eager to read kind of people. So don't beat yourself up if your kids would rather be riding their bike or playing in the garden or doing something different, mm -hmm. but keep reading to them. Absolutely, absolutely. Then the last, um, the last in our discipline subject section is writing. Um, and in that section, we've got mine and Shirley's favorites. Um, Shirley will chat in a second about the excellence in writing system and we, we did use that in our primary school years and found it to be exactly that, excellent, it was really good. Um, and then in, when I was homeschooling my last child, my other kids had already finished GED and whatever and we still needed to work on creating um, a writer out of someone who didn't naturally write. And we stumbled across Susan Wise Bauer's um, Complete Writer series. And I wish that I had known about it right at the beginning, to be quite honest. It is probably one of the most interesting and thorough ways to write. And the, the added bonus is that Susan Wise Bauer is a homeschool graduate herself and um, follows the classical education system. You can check her out at A Well-Trained Mind. And um, you can take a look at the different programs. She can explain to you the diagnostics and how to choose where your child is. In the high school program, Writing with Skill, she uses the system of copying from the masters the same way that um, great artists of the past learned to become great artists themselves was by copying. So with this, you start to study um, really interesting texts through a wide variety of subjects from history all the way through to the classics and to practice those writing skills so that you can uh, deliver papers, particularly of a high school level, um, but you know, starting with the fundamentals in the Writing with Ease program. So highly, highly recommend that. 
Um, the other two that I've written down there are again, comes up all the time in chats, have not used the good and the beautiful, have not used Brave Writer, but highly recommended from other homeschoolers. Um, but um, yeah, so Shirley, if you want to just quickly run through the discipline, uh, the, the uh, excellence in writing, I also just want to note that we've got 10 minutes. If we are cut off folks, you can just log back in on the same login details and Shirley and I will be here. But Shirley, you want to chat about excellence in writing quickly? Yeah, so what I liked about this is that Andrew Padua's attitude is that as a young boy, he hated writing. And so, you know, he wants to make it easy for children to learn to write good essays. And instead of hammering them with the theory of language, like having to learn definitions of nouns and definitions of verbs and adverbs and all this, stuff that so many other programs use he makes it a really practical exercise and so in the beginning for example the child doesn't even have to think about what they're going to write about he gives them a text then he teaches them to make actually to make notes so you've got to take each sentence summarize it in three keywords that you jot down and for every sentence you have three keywords and you're allowed to use symbols and non-alphanumeric things as well. And then later on, the exercise is to take your keywords and rewrite that passage in your own words. So the child doesn't even have to think what they're gonna write about. It just takes that stress away. They, they've, given, they've given the words and now they've just got to put them together. And so they're playing with language by putting the words together. And then as the program advances in every Every lesson, there'll be a different text that you are breaking down and then rewriting, but he gives different skills that you need to do. So the first one is you've got to add an L-Y word. So an L-Y word is actually known as an adverb, but the child doesn't have to even think of one. There's a list, so he can choose from generally, interestingly, incidentally, amazingly, and you know that's the, what he calls the dress up. So every sentence has, every text has to have so many dress ups which are given and taught. And it makes it you know, a really easy way to, um, to learn to write good essays. And then so you go from learning initially how to write a good paragraph into writing three paragraphs and then five paragraphs. And then he teaches what's a good intro, what's a good conclusion. And eventually the children are equipped to write good essays. Yeah. And, it's a multi-level teaching program. So when we first started using it, I had a 10-year-old and a 12-year-old. They could both use the same program. And then when you buy it, you can also get in digital format the texts that are more suitable for a younger child. So then if you've got a seven or eight-year-old, you can download that. And they all watch the same video lesson, but the actual texts that they're working from are at different levels for the children. But if you've got a young child, you could start with level, I hope it's still called level ABC because they did rename their program and update it. But there was, when I did it, it was level A, B and C. Um, and so it was kind of beginners, middle, primary school and then high school years. So yeah, and there are lots of add-ons that you can add onto each one as well when you finish the initial program. So it really worked well. And I love linguistics, but I, I realized that I can't give my kids all that technical stuff. They just want to be able to do the basics. Yeah, yeah, lovely. I mean, I, we, we enjoyed our time with excellence in writing, so I can fully vouch for that program as well. So moving on, we are in a bit of a, a rush here now because we obviously waste a lot of time chatting. We'll quickly just admit somebody else here. Um, the next section that we're going to look at is our discretionary studies. And um, with discretionary studies, you can that's your big basket full of all the fun stuff science history geography arts crafts electronics second third languages coding music typing anything you want goes into that you will dive into that for a season for one of the books for a year um, you'll dive into it when your children are expressing an interest in one of those topics some of them will carry all the way through with some children um, not with others and these ones are where you can put multi ages together so and multi grades um, and we always encourage using um, doing them as unit studies and like i say over there with a strong literature component so that um 
that is just the quick overview of what we're going to do there. And the first one that's up is um, science. And in that space, we have our favorites, um, and um, which is the exploring creation. So um, both of these that we've got over here have got a Christian creationist worldview. Um, the ones under there, the others, Mystery Science, Osborne, and Dorling Kindersley, and there are thousands of others that you can find on the web. But again, remember tonight is about what is tried and tested um, in our own homes with our own children. Um, so while I've used Osborne books and DK books um, as supplementary stuff, there are thousands out there that you can find for yourself. But these two in particular, um, uh, Jeannie Fulbright, is a homeschooling mum. I think there's about nine books in this series now, hey, Shills? Uh, I haven't counted, but there's a whole range. Uh, yeah. There's a whole range, and it's um, the series is called Exploring Creation with, and then it's with land animals, with sea creatures, with astronomy, botany, human body. There's even chemistry and physics now. Um, and those you can buy through Answers, uh, um, in general, Answers in Genesis, yes? No, no, Creation, Creation, creation Answers, like, yes, yes, yes. Um, then the other, the other book that came out after our primary school years, but I've seen it and heard great stuff, is um, Jay Wiley's uh, uh, Exploring, or Science in the Beginning. So they, there he uses history and science to run parallel against um, each other. And very, very popular. Uh, they were sold by a um, homeschooling organization in Natal, but it seems like they're discontinuing a lot of their products. So you'd have to search a little bit to find them. Shelley, is there anything you'd like to add on the science bit? And then we'll all log out and log back in, I think. No, that's it. Let's, let's do that. Let's log out and then start the next section. Okay, cool. So we'll see you all back here in a few minutes. Um, I was going to actually say one last thing about Jeannie Fulbright stuff is that it follows the Charlotte Mason principle for those who know about Charlotte Mason. Um, if not, go and take a look at our YouTube channel and you can learn a little bit more about her. But she does not deliver up to your children tidbits of information. It's like reading a storybook about botany from beginning to end or a storybook about astronomy. Um, lovely hands on appropriate um, activities, not busy work. And, um, and just lit again, simple. Shirley and I, with our children, wanted simple homeschooling, relaxed homeschooling. Um, and we would sit down, open up a book, and then um, read. We didn't need to have like we said right at the beginning, seven years of um, zoology or botany or anything behind that. We could be professionals because we would deliver up the, some of the most amazing um, information through Jeannie's books in their primary school years. In fact, Jeannie's book, um, Exploring Creation with Astronomy, was the spark in my son's life. And he is still today following his desire to be involved in space travel in some way. Um, so you never know, just um, dip into that basket of discretionary goodies. All right, so Shirley, um, you are up now with um, the next thing. We're looking at um, history and what we are going to do is we're going to quickly look at footprints and as the South African history, we are going to cover world history as well. Um, so this is in our discretionary studies. Discretionary studies are all of the lovely stuff, history, geography, sciences, etc. So um, this is just an introduction about footprints on our land and Shirley's going to give us a run through of the, um, the program as it stands for those parents who are interested. I'm going to okay. let you share your screen. Right, so Footprints on Our Land is the first program that Wendy and I put together because we wanted our own children to learn about South Africa. Up until that point, we'd only been using American homeschooling programs 
and we knew that they were missing out on learning about our history, our culture, our plants, our animals, everything about South Africa. And so we started collecting stories because we like literature based learning. And then we found reference books that um, confirmed that the stories were based on history. And we started writing little lessons for our kids. So Footprints comes with a whole little bunch of read aloud stories and one or two reference books that are biographies, um, a factual book, some poetry, and yeah, I think the others are just all biographies, the other reference books. Then um, it's not just about history. It's based around the stories which are historical fiction, but it's a unit study. So it includes all those other discretionary subjects, geography, you know, arts, craft, technology, some science as well. Um, it, and, and so what happens is you read a story and then the lessons that you get in the parent manual make it easier for you to have discussions about topics that come up or to do activities. So as a, a sample, I've just got the first lesson in the book, which I'll share now with you. Uh, how do I close that side thing? Anyway. All right, so we've got Hamka, Man of Men. We give you a little summary of what the story is about. Just tell me if I'm scrolling too fast, because I know sometimes there's lag when you're sharing a screen. Are you all right? Um, I think I must also zoom out a bit. Oh gosh, why am I so technically? <laughs> Today's just not a good day. There we go. Let's get a whole page on the screen. Then we give you a lesson outline so that at a glance, you can see all the topics that come up in a particular story. There are some Bible themes, which also come out of the story. So a lot of them are stories of young people sort of coming of age and discovering their identity, overcoming their fears, um, overcoming problems in relationships, things like that. And so there's some good principles that we draw out of these stories. Copy work is again a Charlotte Mason idea that children learn by copying from great authors. And so to practice handwriting and to learn good grammar, they can copy text from the books that they're reading. And then chapter by chapter, we, we look at the different topics. So we establish where each story takes place by marking it on the map, which I'll show you just now. And then this book happened to have a lot of history and a lot of language arts in the beginning. So as we read, if they discover, if we discover a good example of personification or a good metaphor or uh, uh, alliteration or something, we teach kids what those are so that they're actually seeing how other authors are using those skills. And then there's some activities where you have to go and do a little bit of research like uh, discovering if there are any family heirlooms in your own family or family history, like where your family came from. And a lot of families have had great fun discovering whether they come from French Huguenot stock or from wherever, whatever their roots are, they, they've sort of dug around a little bit and discovered their origins. So for a mom, it's really easy. You just look over the lessons that are coming up chapter by chapter and there's no arts or crafts or anything that you have to specially plan for um, besides going to the supermarket. You know, we don't require you to go to the hardware store to get one product and to the pharmacy to get another product. As moms, we didn't have time for that. So we make it as easy as possible for you. And then, um, what was the other thing I was thinking to say now? Yeah, so everything is there at a glance. And what uh, the problem I was going to mention was that the children love the story so much that they don't want you to stop reading. So we were generally a few chapters behind with our activities because we just would keep reading the story, but we didn't always make time to do all the activities on the same day. And what's great about Footprints is that you can do that and it's flexible and you can spend time on activities that are really interesting to your children. And if there's something that's not so interesting, let's say temperate forests, you can just read this lesson, mark it as done, 
and move on. And you can even pick and choose and skip things if you think that they're not relevant or not appropriate or whatever your circumstances. So we really like families to customize the program to, to suit their own children. Along with the stories, we give you this big poster sized laminated outline map of South Africa, which you can write on with whiteboard markers. And for every story, there is a picture disc, which is what you're seeing on that image, where the children can color it in, cut it out. It's in the back of the manual, so you can make photocopies of these picture discs. And then they can place the picture disc on the map wherever this event took place. There's some closer samples of how the picture discs look. And then we also give you a timeline and narration book. And this follows the Charlotte Mason idea that children should tell back what they've learned. So they can tell it back by drawing a picture or they can tell back what they've learned by writing a little paragraph on the left hand side page, which is in the middle of your screen. And for children who are not really very skilled at writing yet, they can narrate and you can be their secretary and scribe and write down what they say and then you've still got a record of what they tell you that they've learned. On the extreme left side is the actual timeline and this is divided in year increments of 50 years and so you can mark off the events in South Africa's history as they happened and we also use the picture discs there to illustrate the points and any other images like there's a photo of Jan van Riebeek that we photocopied and, and stuck in the book and so each child has their personal history timeline book, just so that they understand the flow of the history that they're learning through the stories. And if you want to, you can even take that further and we did it on the wall. We made a timeline from the roof to the floor using a fax roll, which we also divided into 50 year increments. And then we wrote things down and, uh, and stuck the picture discs on. And it was amazing to me one time we went to the Klein Plassey Museum complex in, at Whistler in the Western Cape. And in the museum, there was a, an image on the wall, like a poster size image of Jan van Riebeek. And just because we'd had this up on the wall, um, and somewhere on it, we had had the picture of Jan van Riebeek. My four-year-old looked up and said, Mom, look, there's Jan van Riebeek. And so it's amazing just how having things stuck around on the wall, they do learn. So as we said, it's a unit study. And in our manual, we give you maps and diagrams and all kinds of things and lessons that cover this whole list of different subjects. And then as an optional extra, you can download these printable lab book projects and use them for revision. And the children cut out these little booklets and write things on that answer specific questions that they're asked to do on each one. And that's a nice way of making a keepsake and revising what you've learned through your literature based studies. Because when you've just read a book, you don't often have much to show for it. And grandparents like to see these kind of things when they come to visit. <laughs> it looks a bit schoolish. And, and the great thing about Footprints is that we're in South Africa and we're learning about South Africa. And so you can go out to places and let your children see things, you know, our flora and fauna. There are places where you can get up close to the animals, um, you know, touch things, go to museums. <laughs> these are just some photos of ours and our clients. Go to places of interest. Uh, maybe you want to chip in and talk about this outing, Wendy. Yeah, that's. Um, I'm maybe going to try and do the the click, but that's quite too. That's up on the west coast, and it's a um, sand sand village. Yes, and just the most um, fascinating experience for the kids. They even go tracking with the trackers. Um, they do a whole language. Where where has the language gone to? Where have the people gone to? what conservation efforts um, to actually keep the nation alive. Um, yeah, it's fantastic. We did it twice. That was the first time in 2008, and then we did it a bit later when our youngest was a bit older. Um, you know, and the, I think the pleasure with studying South Africa like this is that you can read the stuff in a storybook, and then you can write about it and draw about it and do all these hands-on activities, but then you can go. And when you go, your children cement the, what they've learned in a completely different way. We spoke in the primary school thing about us visiting, in the preschool thing last week about visiting Mossel Bay and the, the kids clambering all over the caravel 
um, and just reliving the story and then realizing that the story is actually true. So, um, yeah, just amazing. Uh, there's your family on, on the camera. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just amazing stuff um, to study your own country. So I'm just going to show a few more pics of, you know, this was at... Um, yeah, that's observatory. No, th no, this one is the observatory. That was um, an oh, this is the one in Cape Town. This is the one in Cape okay. Town, yeah, yeah. And so, you know, we, our children, can, we can just get out there and do things with our kids, let them experience different things. Um, I love this one of the family that were learning about penguins and here's their little penguin crafts. Mm -hmm. So besides outings, you know, we can learn anywhere, anytime. And we can go and touch and feel the things that we're learning about. And that's what often helps children just to cement it. Here's a, I love this. Uh, this family went on an outing to the castle in Cape Town. But then look at this. That is their model of the castle built out of farm rubble. <laughs> and to us, it just looks like a heap of trash. But I can see that those kids have spent time thinking about what they were laying out there. Yeah, all the different and, and that That's what we often saw with our own kids, that they would learn about something and then you'd see it in their play. Uh, but here, the same family went to the uh, Huguenot Monument. Uh, and then here's another lovely one. This little guy has built his ox wagon. Obviously, they <laughs> live where they've got supplies that they can build these things with. Yeah. And we can take our children to art galleries to let them be inspired by the works of art and sculpture of, of other artists. We've spoken before about encouraging our children to appreciate poetry by having a regular poetry and tea and teaching them about that kind of culture too, something different. And ultimately, we just want our children to learn about their own country and to know that they have a part to play and that they can contribute to their communities. Oh. And that's sort of our, our goal and our vision with Footprints. It also comes with its own Charlotte Mason style language arts program. So when you're using this program, it's great to use this printable language arts program, which is based on the stories that you're reading. And each language arts lesson has a copy work or dictation paragraph taken from the story. And then little um, activities and sentence building activities to teach them, you know, the structure of language which was created by one of our clients because she wanted something like that for her own children. So that's, that's footprints, Wendy. Next, yeah. next topic. <laughs> okay. So then I'm going to have to take back um, the host from you. If you can finish your screen and I'm going to reclaim host and our next topic will be world history. Um, so we, quickly just get this up for you um, we're going to shortly do a video for our YouTube channel that discusses how we um, alternate footprints and sunlight um, but you can say footprints and anything else in terms of your your world history choices um, Footprints only covers South African history. It does run all the way through, right from um, the beginning through to where we are currently. Uh, but in between our footprints years, you want to expose your children to world history. So the two that, um, the main one that both Shirley and I used as the alternating year is sunlight. Um, Sunlight has a couple of American history years, which aren't necessary to do all of them, which is where um, footprints kind of slots in quite beautifully. Um, the other thing that I did in my children's high school years, um, just as a, a springboard to revise history before uh, two of them went into doing the GED, was work through the story of the world. But it is actually, I think, for an upper primary um, sort of aged child. There are four volumes in it. Again, it's written, written by Susan Weisbauer, who I mentioned earlier for the Complete Writer series and her website, Well Trained Mind. And she takes you right the way through world history. There's an activity book that goes with it. We never used the activity book. We just read those chapters in the story of the world and then read additional books to go along with each um, 
each of those sections. But in terms of a complete curriculum to do in between footprints years, um, I can't recommend sunlight high enough. It is very thorough. Um, it, you can take as many of the bells and whistles as you would like in terms of, um, you know, it, it's got language arts and it's got history and it's got science and it's got um, all these additional subjects, but you can also just take the history package and use that alone um, for the different grades as and when you need them. Shirley, you're going to have to take over. I'm just going to get rid of two very noisy cats. Okay. Um, I just wanted to add that the story of the world, uh, different, there's, there's four volumes, but some of them are actually included in the Sunlight um, program as well. So we've also enjoyed those. And then the, the nice thing about Sunlight, as Wendy said, is that you can pick and choose which components you want. It gives you a very structured schedule, which you don't have to stick to, but it's just nice to have it as a guide as to what sequence to read the books in. I often found, again, that if we were enjoying a book, we would often read ahead, and some of the books were more heavy going, and we sometimes, you know, took a little bit, we were a bit slower than what the schedule said. And for me, I was always juggling babies and toddlers and interruptions and things, so we just went at our own pace. But generally, you can get through one call in a year. And um, we, we enjoyed the American history because, you know, America is a superpower in the world today. And if you understand how they got to where they are, it also helps you to understand life today in the world. Mm -hmm. And it was also very interesting to see the parallels between the development of that country and the development of South Africa, because a lot of things that happened in Europe and the rest of the world impacted both these young colonies um, growing up. So um, yeah, Sunlight is great in that it gives you all these wonderful stories from around the world that your children learn about other cultures and other countries and where they come from. Yeah, so I'm just quickly replying to somebody over here, which we should probably do afterwards. Um, we, we should have somebody answering text questions for us because it's very difficult to juggle all these tasks when you're talking. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. So then we're going to let's carry on moving down into our delightful learning. I'm going to be going to chat a little bit about geography, considering that um, we do cover in footprints geography, but only as it comes up in the lessons. And yes, you're going to study how rivers um, form and um, you know the different stages of a river and you're going to look at the how how mountains form because of you know during the great trek and going over the Drakensberg and you're going to look at the Orange River and you're going to do a lot of local South African geography but if you want to dig more into South African geography um, Ursula has she's a homeschool mom and she created Meandering in Zanzi which is a, a really, really fun program um, for homeschoolers. On a world geography scale, I cannot recommend um, Anne Voskamp's um, A Child's Geography Higher. It's written in her typical lyrical language, but um, just such a fascinating look right from the core all the way out into the atmosphere and written again in a sort of a living book approach um, that you just sit down and open up and read with your children. There are a couple of hands-on projects at the end. It's multi-level, multi-grade. She did a second one called The Holy Land, which focuses just um, on, on the Middle East. But um, if you're looking for an, a, a broad overview of geography, um, it's, um, a child's geography is great. And if you're looking for more in-depth um, then um, Ursula's program um, is great as well. Is there anything that you would like to um, add? I'm just thinking that, that a lot of people might be getting overwhelmed by all of these wonderful choices that are out there. And I just want to say, you've got, if you've got young children, you've got many years ahead. And don't feel that you've got to do everything right now. Just start with the basics, the discretionary subjects and then maybe a social studies literature-based program. And in different seasons, you'll have time for all these other optional extras, which we are now going through. 
And there, there, are, there are seasons where you just do the minimum and you can't do extra art and extra geography and extra science. And then the other seasons when life is calmer and you've got capacity. So, you know, just remember that. <laughs> Don't be overwhelmed. Yeah, definitely. That's excellent. This is 20 years of trying out different things that yes. we're sharing with you. You give yourself 20 years as well. <laughs> In fact, I was chatting to um, a mum this morning and uh, or this afternoon. And one of the things that it's important to know is that it is exactly as Shady says, it is a journey. Um, and sometimes we have to start with something that is, is tighter. So we build our confidence. And once our confidence grows, we branch out a little bit and, you know, you can add, but it is a journey. Be patient with yourself and be patient with, um, with your children and your process. And one of the things Shirley said before, which I love, is that sometimes we make a mistake when we buy a curriculum and it doesn't work. What should you do? Well, you can bin it, you can sell it, you can put it on a shelf and maybe try it again later. But that the um, important thing that, um, which is the point Shirley made, is that a mistake is only a mistake if you don't learn from it. Next time, maybe check it out a little bit more. Don't rush in. Don't get too excited. So all of the stuff that you're seeing, check it out and see, is this going to work for your family? Because these work for ours and they are coming with our recommendation. Um, the last thing that we're going to, to quickly look at, and then we're going to go to a time of question and answers, is... Um, our other resources and this is really I mean this is just a, a drop in the ocean but these were things that we found worked for us um, obviously there's thousands of art resources on the website but we highly recommend Nadine Esther Hazen's practical pages it's um, exactly that it's a WordPress site practical pages and she has got um, she's an art teacher fine art teacher herself but she homeschooled her three children she has so many resources there for you from handwriting and maths and all sorts of things but a lot of the strength lies in her arts her music her composer studies um just their gentle lovely approach to education there's a lot of stuff for planning for organization and everything but we want to just highlight her art and craft and music um tonight um, Shirley, you want to chat about the tech side of things? We used a couple of those, but I think you know them in more detail. Yeah, so I'm going to start at the bottom with BBC dance mat typing. I just think that in this day and age, if you're not teaching your children to touch type, it's like not teaching your kids to read. Everything is digital nowadays, and I can see the difference between myself and friends I have who still pick the keyboard with two fingers. You can just accomplish so much more, so much faster if you can touch type. And so I've made all my children learn to touch type from a young age using that BBC dance mat typing. And I don't even supervise them. I just say to them, go and do your typing. And they, you know, they do 20 minutes or so of the lesson. It's free. It's online. If you do a Google search for it, you'll find it. It's a little animated typing program that's really fun. And for older kids who maybe don't want to see little tunes and animations, there's another one called Typing Trainer. And if you Google, you'll actually find a whole host of others that are also free. But those are two that my family have used. Uh, then I'll jump to the top. My eldest son was interested in, he likes building things and putting things together. And so I enrolled him in this quick study labs, the electronics course that's called the Edison Project. It was created by an American homeschool dad and you, you pay for a section at a time. So it's eight lessons and it normally takes one term to work through it. You have to buy an electronics kit that the child uses to do those lessons. And at the end of each section of eight lessons, the kids actually get a certificate and it teaches them the basics of circuits and all those kind of things, which I don't know very much about. And again, he was about 12 I just enrolled him each term and he would work through those lessons um, on his own. And there was also a quiz that he would submit to the teacher who would, you know, and he'd get a score. So there was some kind of measurement of his progress, which he enjoyed. So I can recommend that. And then even on our website, we also have a list of other techie type of programs that other homeschool families have recommended to us. If your kids want to learn coding, 
Um, I know Blender is one that teaches animation free. My 18 year old's actually currently teaching herself a bit of animation. But even younger kids that were homeschooled have used that. And some of them have gone into that as a career. And it started just with tinkering around at home using these free programs. So, you know, the whole world is at your fingertips nowadays with online stuff. So just, you know, ask your kids, would you like to learn coding? Would you like to learn animation? And at the minimum, let them learn type typing. Yeah. So just as mentioned there on coding, um, all right, we've got 10 minutes to the end. So we're going to have to move into um, questions now. But in terms of coding, I think that it's important in this sort of all our kids that we have are digital natives. They were born into this and it will basically take care of itself. They will learn um, technology um, like the back of their hand. It is your job as a parent to follow the golden rule. And the golden rule is this. Read to your children. <laughs> they will, they will really, their strengths will take care of their strengths. You use literature to fill in the gaps. You lose, use literature to calm down an anxious child. When days are going wrong, pull out a book, do it outside in nature to get a double whammy, but read to your children, fill in their gaps. Um, if they're only science orientated, fill in their gaps with history. Um, read the classics to them. Read, 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 read. Um, and the other things, their strengths will take care of themselves. Um, so that was, that was, I think, almost everything that we had to say. I'm just reading through the questions and I'll do that for now. But if there is anybody that would like to ask a question verbally for everybody else um, to hear, you can unmute yourself you don't have to take the video off just unmute yourself and ask your question and then Shirley and I can reply for the next 10 minutes or so um, just when you're saying that our kids are digital natives and the tech side will almost take care of themselves I got out a sunlight curriculum a while ago and one of the books that's prescribed was an introduction to Microsoft. And I just said to my kids, oh, you don't need to do that. They're like, what is it, mom? I said, that's an old fashioned book from long ago where parents had to teach their children how to use a computer. But you guys will know that stuff already. You can yeah. skip that. <laughs> so I'm sure by now they've removed it from the, the curriculum, but I've got an older version, so it's still in there. <laughs> yeah. All right, if there aren't any questions, um, okay, there's somebody coming on. I do Hi. have a question. Great. <laughs> yes, um, okay, so I've got um, four kids. My eldest is already doing high school work, but my three younger ones in primary school, I, um, I love the eclectic approach, but I sometimes feel that I struggle um, with the fact that um, giving enough time between doing the, the structured, um, the discipline subjects versus the, um, the fun things. How do you, okay, or do you have any advice how to structure that? Because it feels to me that sometimes we end up only working on the discipline and then everybody's tired and frustrated and it's been a long day already. And then I don't have the energy to do all the fun stuff that I wanted to do. Do you have any ideas, tips, advice, Please. Welcome to homeschooling. <laughs> I think we all feel like that so much of the time. It's like so much to do and we just don't always have the energy for all these ideal things that we see other people doing. So it, it is a challenge, but I think if we try and limit the discipline subjects to 20 minutes a day for each of those or half an hour as the kids are a little bit older, that's an hour and a half. Then you should actually have time in your day for doing those other things. But I know we're not always that organized, life in interferes, so it can be a challenge. And I always felt like I never did enough of the creative stuff. I still feel like that. And yet when I look back, it's like I've got photos on some of our websites and things about it. Then I think, wow, we did that. Wow, we did that. So I think you know, you, you feel like you're not doing enough, but over time, if you're doing it every now and then, you'll see that actually you are. And, and sometimes you also have to 
wait until the children want to do things. You know, I sort of feel like I'm not a great cook and chef in the kitchen. I sort of just do what I need to do. But now I've got a 13 year old daughter who will just go and bake because she wants to. I don't have to say, oh, come, let's bake cookies today. So in some families, people are more creative than in others. And I think just the, the discipline subjects are important. So you don't want to neglect those because then you're going to feel guilty about that. So there's, we always feel like there's more we should be doing. Um, that's what we call the dis-ease of the homeschool mom. Am I doing enough? Because you're doing what you can cope with, but then you hear about all these other things that Wendy and I have just shared, but you can't do all of them in one season. So, if, you know, the discipline things are probably the most important and do what you can with the rest. The other thing that I would then add is also we schooled in the primary years only four days a week. And on the fifth day, we did the fun stuff. Yes. Uh, that was the, the day that we did all the science experiments or outings or um, group art projects, that sort of thing. So you also don't have to stick to a five-day school week. Remember, you've left the system. You don't need to fit into the system any longer. You need to fit your life around this process. Um, and I would also encourage you to read some of Charlotte Mason and um, Corin Andriola's stuff. Um, where they talk about structuring the short lesson day, 20 to 40 minutes of maths, then alternated with a nice reading book, 20 to 40 minutes of um, focused language work, then a nice science reading book, you know, and you, you kind of mishmash your stuff together. Otherwise, you're going to really get stuck in that grind. Um, okay, so anybody else got a question that you would like to ask to everybody? Wendy, I've got a question. Um, I actually have two. Um, first off, you know, I've, I've just started homeschooling and, and I came across your program a while ago, which is obviously why I'm on the chat now. Um, my boys are little and I'm starting out on this, you know, this journey now and it's been incredible, but I just want to maybe get a bit of clarification from you. Um, where do you go from, from primary school? Obviously, you know, at some point they might want to go to university and what do they need to have in order to get into a university? I know I've seen some talk on GED and A-levels and um, the Cambridge thing, but when do you change, you know, at what age or at what grade do you change over to that? And what's most ideal for South African universities? Sure. Okay. That's quite a big question. Let's see how much we can fit in. Um, I switched over when my children were ready. Um, <laughs> that doesn't help you at all, I realize. But um, basically, when the children start to take ownership of their own education, if you go and look on our YouTube channel, we have um, How to Raise Independent Learners. Um, that was different for each of my children. Um, one of my children did... Um, GD at 18, my youngest started his um, Cambridge at 14, was finished his matric by 17, etc. So what I mean is that you tailor make in their primary school years. When they hit high school years, we often have a wobbly as parents and think, oh, now we've got to get all formal. No, not necessarily so either. What you want to do is to slowly, slowly hand over the reins of their education to them so that you become a facilitator from about 16 and about is said quite loosely. And um, in terms of what that looks like thereafter, if your children are going into a private college and they don't need exemption, GED is great, it's quick, it's focused, you can get it done within a, a relatively short period of time um, at um, relatively low cost. If your children want to go into the sciences, into the maths, anything like that, engineering, then Cambridge is your better route. And both of those are accepted in the country, but only Cambridge. Um, for the quickest, easiest direct um, access to South African universities, and particularly, like I said, if you want to go into the sciences. So that is down the line. If you want to check more about the high school stuff or hear more, we're going to be covering that next week, Thursday. So put that into your diary. We have less than a minute to go, folks. Um, so should you have to log in again if okay. anybody wants, but you're right. going to have to just post the meeting. That's, that's fine. Um, we can all log in again if there are other questions because we're going to lose it. Stacey, if you can just quickly copy and paste your question and then put it into the new chat because we are about to go. 
we will chat again in a few minutes. So if you want to go, have a lovely evening further and others will see you back in a few seconds. How's it, Stacey? Yes. I, I, I didn't know how to copy and paste it. I <laughs> no, no problem, go for it. When you say read, like read, 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 I hear it all the time. Mm. Um, I read a lot of storybooks and the classics and things like that, but should I also be reading a lot of factual books? I mean, I seem to re start reading it to them and then I lose them. It's like, oh, well, like, you know, um, read, read, read. So Stacey, how old are your children? Five and eight. So no, I would, what, what you're aiming for is to create an atmosphere in your home. Yeah. You have books. Books give us information, books teach us. So you're looking for, you know, just cuddling up on a couch a couple of times a day, reading anything that takes their interest, reading the same book over a hundred times. And, um, you know, we have got books that you just read and read and they dog it and they loved. And in fact, my daughter tonight is 25 years of age. And she said, do you remember Shirley Hughes's books, mom? And, um, you know, those were the books that I read when she was this tiny tot and we read them so many times they ingrained in her mind. There comes a time where you're going to want to bring more technical stuff in, but in general, um, that should be something that they pursue themselves. Uh, we really, um, we really hold to the living book, Charlotte Mason approach, is that mm -hmm. what you want to do is read books that place your children in a time period or in that person's thinking that lived there, smelt it, touched it, believed it, lived, you know, walked it um, more than you want the technical stuff. So yeah, don't stress about that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Pleasure. It's been wonderful. Thank you. Good. Other questions? I think people are worrying about what to do in the primary school years to equip their kids to cope well at high school and beyond. And using any of these curricula or any others that you choose if they were created for homeschooling they are usually very good quality curriculums and by homeschooling you are giving your children a one-on-one -on -one education where they don't ever get left behind where you pick up when they've missed something so there's no gaps in for example a subject like maths which is really built layer by layer and because of that you are giving them a strong foundation. They're going to be strong in maths, confident in their language arts. Even if, even though some of us are not good at languages or not naturally interested in maths or whatever, but we're going to give them a good foundation and then help them to discover what they are good at. And when they get to the high school years, you know, then they'll have hopefully some more direction, but they'll have the skills that they need no matter which high school option you choose. So whether you enroll them in distance learning to do the South African matric or Cambridge or GED, you will have built the skills that they need into them. And one of the most important things is not only the academics, but as Wendy said, that self-motivation and self-discipline. So by the high school years, you are eventually more of a supervisor and not the teacher. The homeschool programs are designed to help children to do self-study actually. And that's what we're equipping them for because for the rest of their lives, they've got to learn how to learn and anything that they're gonna do, you want them to choose to do it and be self-motivated and not have to, you can't just stand there with this metaphorical whip, come on, do your work, come on, do your work. You know, you, you, you're training up adults, not children. Yeah, definitely. It's a good point, Shirley. Um, sorry, message is coming through. Yaku and Taryn, um, are the, it's called Practical Pages. Shirley, maybe oh, you can drop a URL there for them. Um, practical Stop. Pages. Anybody would like to ask another question? Otherwise, I'm going to retire for the night. <laughs> I have a very quick question. Um, after... Uh, much um, research we decided on footprints and then we managed to find a second-hand copy of footprints which we love and we've just almost finished Kamka now um, my son is nine but trying to find all about South Africa is like trying to find hen's teeth you can't get the book anymore yeah. is there another book or one or two books that you would suggest we look for instead 
You can actually buy it on Google Play as an ebook. So if you send me an email, I'll send you a link to it. I'll, I'll Google it. It's cool. You sure? That's fine. Yeah, Thank you. That's it's awesome. been out of print for a long time. And every time we ask them if they're going to print it, they say that a lot of the information in it is redundant. And it's taking a while for them to, to bring in a um, comparative book. So for right now, um, we just refer people through to the ebook. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Pleasure. I just have a quick question. Um, Lost you, Renel? Um, can okay. I really do that? Some because I've got like an eight-year-old, a five-year-old, and a baby, um, <laughs> and I look at it and I'm like, uh, would this work in my sort of in my setting, or is there a way to do it? you know, the Afrikaans route or, yeah. Okay, so Renel, I lost the first, but Shirley, did you get everything? Was it my? Yes, I, I know I got what she said. Okay. Um, she homeschools in Afrikaans. She's got young children and sort of eight and under and would, would footprints work? So I'm just going to post a link in the chat that you guys can all go and read later if you are Afrikaans speaking. And it's a page on our website about other families and how they've used our little footprints and footprints on our land in Afrikaans. So in both programs, some of the books have previously been printed in Afrikaans. Most of them are out of print, but we give them to you in footprints. You can buy the Afrikaans versions, the, the older program in little footprints. We give you the list and you can try and find them at the library or online. And then you read the manual as the mom, but you implement everything that you're learning in your mother tongue. And so the children just get more exposure to English through reading the stories that are only in English. And most Afrikaans families are very good at encouraging their children to learn English. And so it works well for them. But we are actually at the moment working on a slightly modified version of Footprints that's going to be probably called Footspura. And we're hoping that by next year that will be available for Afrikaans families. So it's not going to be exactly the same as Footprints on Our Land, but it will include some of the books that are in Afrikaans and the same concepts. So look out for that. But in the meantime, for example, if your kids are the age of Little Footprints, you can use Little Footprints and apply everything they're learning in Afrikaans. It would work. Yeah. All right, any other questions out there? Where do we get the link to join in next week for the high school chat? So um, we, we do it in phases. We give early warning to, um, it's total favoritism, so you'll just have to forget, excuse us, <laughs> on our Footprint Facebook group. So um, you're welcome to pop over there and join it. We let everybody know at the beginning of the week when it's coming and the time and that sort of thing. And then the day before we put it out on the eclectic homeschooling group. And then we just kind of judge to make sure that um, the first people up will have space. And if we know that there's going to be under 100 people, we'll open up um, the, the meeting wider on the Western Cape or South African homeschooling groups. So join Footprints. That's where you'll get um, the early notification. Wendy, I was just thinking, we didn't anticipate that this session would take us so long, long. that we'd actually have to log in three times. So I'm thinking maybe we should pre-record our presentation and then put it up and right afterwards have uh, the question and answer session. Mm -hmm. I don't know how people think that could work, but then it would save us all having to log in and out so many times because we don't have a paid prescription to Zoom. Okay, well, why don't we chat about that and, and if people have got any ideas, you know, in terms of it, just... Welcome to email us if you've got other suggestions, but yeah. that yeah. could be a solution. Cool. Because I think the high school one might drag out as well. People have a lot of questions about that. Yeah, definitely. All right, folks. Well, if everybody has um, had their brains tickled and got some questions answered, uh, we're going to say good night. Um, thank you very much for being with us. It's lovely to get to know more homeschoolers in this way. Thank night you so night. much for your time. Pleasure. Night, night, everyone.